All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> um, today on the church calendar is the observance of Alexander Crummel, um, who was uh, an African-American uh, who sought ordained ministry and uh, experienced racism throughout his life. He uh, was denied admittance to General Seminary in the 19th century early and um, ended up uh, getting ordained in Massachusetts and um, struggled the whole time with uh, life in this uh, part of the world, went to Liberia uh, to encourage uh, um, uh, American, African-Americans to go back to, to Liberia and, uh, and then came back here and he ended up dying in Red Bank, New Jersey uh, after uh, a ministry of consciousness raising and ministry of the gospel. He was an evangelist and preacher, and uh, so we celebrate him and honor him today. Here's the collect. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you for your servant, Alexander Crummel, whom you called to preach the gospel to those who were far off and to those who were near. Raise up in this and every land evangelists and heralds of your kingdom, that your church may proclaim the unsearchable riches of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, good evening. It's nice to see everybody um, on the, online here. It's been a, a few weeks, and I thank you for that. Um, we had a staycation. We didn't really, uh, you know, in, in the life of a bishop, things intrude anyway, but it was nice to be off Zoom and be able to change up my schedule some, and so we're thankful for that. We didn't go anywhere. Um, sort of the you know, I think it's a similar experience to a lot of folks in their COVID-19 world. Um, uh, but it was, a, it was a, a little bit different time. So that was good. There were a few days when I came down, did my exercises, had breakfast and went up and took a nap. So um, that was a good thing to do. Uh, it, uh, so we are, we are now uh, back and um, I'm thankful to staff who kept things going. Uh, everyone had a week off last week. I thought that was important just to try to shut down as much as we could. And uh, uh, so I thank you for your patience with that as well. <clears throat> um, I, I, I wanted to open tonight by just saying what I said to the clergy this morning as well, that, um, you know, it's clear, uh, it's, I'm, 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 I'm even clearer now coming out of summer, uh, heading into fall, and I've been feeling this way for a little bit of a while, um, that, you know, we are, we, we all are recognizing we're in this environment for the long haul. And I think it's important for us to, to really stay, say that out loud, say it out loud a number of times and own it um, because um, denial is a powerful force. When COVID-19 first started uh, in early March, I think most of us sort of felt, well, you know, we'll endure this and uh, get over it and then get back to normal. And, uh, and we kind of had that approach and figured, well, you know, maybe, maybe after Easter, we can get back to our routine and get back in church and things like that. And, and it began to dawn on us pretty quickly that that was not going to be that simple. And I think now it's dawning on us that, in fact, um, there is a new normal, that we will never go back to what was, that the world has been profoundly changed. Uh, I was looking at um, uh, uh, Steve actually sent to staff. Um, uh, an article with these statistics on what's going on in New York City and office occupancies. And uh, I mean, they're just, uh, you know, 10% of what they could manage. And, and this is going to be permanent for a lot of employees. Uh, so it's a huge uh, permanent impact on, on, on our world and how we function. And, uh, and we're going to need to own that again and just recognize and adapt. And I think that that's really the key message here. Um, we uh, have been tremendously impacted as church and we will continue to be. Pew Research just came out with some uh, uh, work on church folk and how they're adapting uh, to the COVID-19 and uh, virtual worship. And many are perfectly comfortable with, perf with, uh, with virtual worship and uh, will likely uh, make that um, uh, you know, a permanent part of the way that they do worship. And as a church, we're going to offer it because we've discovered that we've been reaching people who we had not otherwise been reaching. And that's not unimportant. Um, uh, I've said before, we probably should have been doing some of the stuff we're doing now 10 years ago uh, because we had the technology to do it, but we've been pushed into it now and it will be a, a permanent uh, way of our doing ministry. 
in this whole thing. We've, um, as, as sad and tragic as it has been, and we've experienced loss and will continue to experience loss, uh, we've also experienced gain and uh, learned some things and growth. And uh, I, I think for many people, I know for my own prayer life has deepened in all of this. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I'm profoundly aware of that. And I suspect that's true for others. So uh, I just say that as kind of an overview, but, but also to be more specific for us as a diocesan community. Uh, I don't anticipate, especially in this, in the, in the, within the next several months to year, uh, that we're going to have in-person meetings. Uh, our default will be virtual meetings. Uh, we, uh, making an, a face-to-face, person-to-person meeting uh, at this juncture to me makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, unless it's absolutely necessary, uh, because the risks are still high. And we are, uh, you know, we are, I, I'm fearful that we are entering the fall and that uh, as people go indoors, the threat will increase again of, uh, of the pandemic, of people becoming ill. Uh, we know that outdoors is better than indoors. Uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci said that to a, a meeting that I was part of with the House of Bishops. Um, uh, and um, so, you know, and the flu season's coming and all of that stuff. So I, I, I'm sure that this, I'm confident that the situation is not going to be such that we can say, oh, well, let's, you know, let's start meeting again at Trenton. And, and so I'm expecting my staff uh, who can work at home to work at home. Uh, and most of them now are working at home. Uh, some go in, there's Steve. Um, some are going into the office uh, and Nadi goes into the office regularly. Um, some of the folks in the, in the, um, in the accounting functions go in uh, regularly, but most of us have been able to work very efficiently from home and will continue to do that. And so, um, so I wanted to make that statement as well about how we're going to proceed uh, as a diocese. Um, and, uh, and I want to encourage, uh, you know, the churches are reopening and, uh, and, and we've gotten, I think, I don't know what the count is right now, but it's, uh, you know, I think we've got more than 120 plans uh, that have been uh, submitted and most have been approved. I'm a little behind right now because of my time off, uh, but I'll catch up with that quickly. Um, not all of those plans are for in-person worship. Some are still only outdoors. Some churches have said that they want to use their spaces uh, for other ministries, but aren't doing indoor worship yet. Uh, I've heard from some clergy and some lay leaders, uh, we're not in a rush and uh, we're, we're just fine with virtual worship. So we're seeing all kinds of things happen in the Diocese of New Jersey, and I'm supportive of them all. Uh, I want communities to discern what God's calling them to, uh, because again, I'm mindful that much of our population is considered vulnerable and at risk, high risk. And we just uh, have to operate with that presumption uh, moving forward. So uh, that's my item A. Uh, my item B is uh, related to that. And that is to say, here we are, we're in the fall. And um, uh, I, I, I'm repeating myself uh, in this quote from Melissa Skelton, who um, uh, again, some of you remember was, the, was one of the nominees to be Bishop of New Jersey when I was elected. And uh, she has a lot of background in congregational development. She's brilliant. She's now the Bishop of Westminster in Canada and, one, and an Archbishop in the Church of Canada. And uh, she was invited to present to a meeting of the, the sponsored by the presiding bishop's office. It's a meeting we have now every other week. We were meeting weekly. But uh, the, the presiding bishop sponsors a meeting for all the bishops of the church and their staff, their canon staffs. And, um, and it's also joint with Episcopal Relief and Development as well as um, 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 CPG, Church Pension Group. And Melissa presented and she said uh, in that meeting something that I think was really important. She said, the context has changed, but the purpose is the same. The context of our ministry has changed. We are now in COVID-19 world uh, in this strange new uh, place. And, uh, and yet our purpose remains the same. That is, we are to carry out Christ's mission of reconciliation in the world. Um, that we are, uh, our purpose as a diocese of New Jersey is to continue to form people as disciples of Jesus Christ, to carry out Christ's mission of reconciliation in the world. And uh, what has changed is 
the context in which we do that and in which we form disciples of Jesus Christ. And that's the hard work that we're now going to have to sort out and figure out. How are we going to do that? Um, our, some of our uh, clergy who are new to cures uh, had fresh start began today. And I had that conversation with them that we need to figure out what Christ is calling us to as church uh, in the midst of this particular context. And it's adaptive work. It's different. Uh, in many ways, uh, I think that we are invited to some things, again, that we may should have been doing years ago, uh, getting the faith in the home, nurturing people in the home. There's an article that I think came out today or recently in Episcopal News Service on people recognizing the value of house churches, of forming faith in the home. Uh, I've been advocating house churches for years. Uh, but here we are, and it's going to be, uh, you know, I think a significant part of how we move forward. So the context has changed, but the purpose is the same. And so I think we need to, again, recognize we're in this for the long haul, that there are many parts of this that are permanent. And we're gonna ask ourselves, how is the Holy Spirit, how is God in Christ leading us forward to be the people of God, the body of Christ in this time and place, in this particular context? And we need to start doing the things that we uh, discern from that reflection. Um, and I think that these, um, uh, I think our town halls, we're gonna start to have, I'm, I'm gonna start to follow the model that, that, that the PBs, uh, the presiding bishops meeting is using. And that is we're gonna start to bring in, I think presenters for a few minutes, 10, 15 minutes at the beginning of the town halls, just to talk about ways that we can source you all as leaders of congregations to do that adaptive work. And uh, um, I think probably at our next town hall, we'll pull you to see the kinds of things that you want and think are important to have some uh, resourcing in. So, um, uh, so look for that. On item C, to say, uh, I am in fact resuming visitations, confirmations, ordinations. I've now I've been to several churches for in-person worship on Sundays. Uh, I did confirmations at All Saints in um, Scotch Plains this past Sunday. I'm going to be doing two ordinations, one uh, after the other, back-to-back -back ordinations at St. John's in Elizabeth this coming uh, Saturday. Uh, we'll be ordaining uh, Thomas Zerba, uh, who came out of Christ Church in Tom's River, and uh, be ordaining Jorge Martinez, who's been serving at St. John's, but also came out of San Andres in Camden. Um, I'm going to be um, doing a visitation it, at uh, Holy Cross North Plainfield on Sunday morning with confirmations. That's going to be outdoor worship, but again, I've done indoor worship. So uh, I'm, if congregations have indoor worship, uh, and um, I'm, I'm, what we're trying to do is get, I, I need to make up some ground with the churches that I missed in the spring and summer who were do their normal visitations. Um, so they're going to get priority in terms of putting on the calendar uh, a visitation from me. But I am open to coming to churches that are doing in-person worship. So just want to make you aware of that. Um, and I think that's it for me. Are there things on the, on the question? I saw a couple of things come up on chat, but I didn't see what they were. Do I need to respond to them now? Uh, just a, a, a couple of little things. Uh, Harry Allen says uh, we are very excited at Holy Cross confirmation. Um, and I shared a link to the um, to the home house church uh, uh, part oh, great. of the Good. Medical, excellent new service. Uh, and then I just had one little quibble with you, Bishop. On <laughs> yeah, um, I very much prefer the term online worship to virtual worship because. Thank you. I, I, that's a, that's a good quibble. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, but I, but I saw in that in that article on uh, Episcopal News Service they call it virtual worship. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's real worship. Right. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you. Thank you. Call um, me on this. Yeah. But that's everything I see. Great. Thank you, sir. All righty. Um, the task force has been working really hard. Dr. Phil Lewis, you're on, and I will stop sharing my screen so that you can share yours. Okay. Super. Thank you, Bishop. Let's see if I can. Uh, I can't find it. Okay.
Okay, Steve, maybe you can give me some assistance here. The, the slides are on my um, desktop, but I can't see them in the window. Uh, so you're, you're hitting the share screen button? Uh, I, well. On the bottom, of your, there you go. Okay, all right, all right, there we go, okay. All right, thanks, Steve. Sure thing. Okay, Oak. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, as I think uh, uh, many, if not most of you know, there have been some changes in the state about um, what are the uh, maximums allowed with regard to uh, gatherings. Um, we have agreed that, uh, as the bishop uh, has agreed, that we would limit uh, gatherings in the uh, diocese to uh, 500. Um, and of course, that assumes that we are uh, approaching all of this reasonably with regard to uh, wearing a mask and uh, maintaining the six foot um, physical distance between folks. Right. And that is outdoor gathering too, to be sure. Yes, yes, that's outdoor gathering. And as the next bullet says, there's a <clears throat> uh, currently a limit of 150 inside uh, or 25% capacity, whichever is lower. And again, the whole deal here is making sure that uh, we maintain uh, the six foot distances and people are masked. Um, there have been uh, a reasonable number of uh, uh, additions and changes with regard to uh, ventilation, particularly as we're coming up to the winter. Uh, it is important to remember that uh, in addition to wearing mask and being uh, six feet away at least from someone else, then um, in rooms uh, that in buildings that the number of air exchanges per hour are important. Um, being able to move air uh, away from your breathing space so that respiratory droplets that might uh, carry the virus are moved away and not breathed in. Uh, now, most uh, uh, high volume air conditioning systems, HVAC systems, uh, in most large buildings and most of our parishes can easily do three to four air exchanges an hour. Um, if you are in a building that does not have an HVAC system, by and large, if you open the doors and windows, you can easily get uh, more than the three or four air exchanges uh, an hour, which is not too bad in the summer. But as the Bishop mission, as we head toward the winter and you want to close doors and windows and keep the <laughs> room warm, and particularly if you're dealing with the radiator heat or something of that sort, uh, maintaining ventilation uh, is, is key. Uh, in most instances, uh, providing enough fans so that there is a, a feeling of a light breeze across your skin uh, will be sufficient. Uh, we did add into the guidelines some references to the use of HEPA filters and ultraviolet light C spectrum. Uh, lights. Uh, those are particularly with regard to HVC systems, although they're all standalone systems that uh, can be used uh, with radiator and uh, other uh, local heating systems. Um, while they can be used, they're not required, uh, and it, they can be cost prohibitive, uh, but uh, they, they are uh, available and uh, can be helpful uh, if, if they are, uh, if it's uh, something the parish can, can handle. Uh, th there is a, a new appendix to the guidelines that lists uh, all this information about ventilation. So, <clears throat> uh, One of the critical things coming uh, towards us here is that um, as parishes are reopening, um, trying to make sure that we have enough volunteers to help make things work is uh, something that it seems we haven't thought through on an individual parish basis perhaps enough. So we just want to highlight for everyone that uh, the number of ushers or volunteers that you have had in the past to uh, ensure people uh, know what to do when they're in the building, that sort of thing, uh, may not be sufficient uh, in the environment that we're in. And so it uh, is important to go ahead and uh, look at that and, and think about uh, what that means for uh, your worship situation. Uh, some of the science around uh, singing and uh, 
instruments and that sort of thing has been progressing a bit. Uh, so the guidelines have been adjusted to uh, allow for wind and uh, brass instruments um, and to have them treated uh, quite the way that we treat it uh, or treat um, vocalists. So the bottom line is that uh, you'd want to have one musician or uh, you could have a group that are of the same um, household or immunological bubble and uh, an immunological bubble. I, the MBA is doing a great job with that. So if you have any association with the MBA, that, that's knowable to you. But if you're not, it just means the idea that um, you have had sufficient testing and been around a group of people long enough that it's, it's obvious that uh, you are not uh, exposing each other uh, to the virus. Uh, so that, uh, at any rate, uh, having uh, up to three or so musicians together or vocalists uh, singing together that are of the same immunological bubble is uh, reasonable to do. However, um, uh, either vocalists or musicians, either uh, solo or uh, in, in uh, uh, three-person groups, uh, need to be 30 feet away from any other person uh, in the parish. That uh, distance can be reduced with plexiglass barriers um, uh, to half. And where the barrier is placed has to be thought through uh, when you're thinking about the uh, instruments, uh, because of course, uh, where the uh, plume uh, of um, uh, respiratory droplets might come from is different for a flute than for a, a trumpet, for instance. So thinking through that, uh, though, uh, it's uh, perfectly uh, reasonable to do. Uh, as you know, there have been uh, a lot of discussions recently about what to do about schools. And uh, New Jersey, as other states, have uh, published guidelines about how to move ahead. Um, the major issue here is really to ensure that um, we are very thoughtful about um, ventilation in rooms, uh, that people are, are able to wear a mask and maintain the six foot distance. Uh, and especially for kids, um, it's important to figure out how you're going to handle traffic flow, um, making sure, especially for young children, that uh, they can maintain the distancing that's uh, required. And also, of course, we don't want uh, materials uh, shared between uh, children. Uh, given that um, the state has moved to allowing indoor uh, dining, uh, we are moving ahead with uh, allowing for a coffee hour and fellowship activities. The challenge here again is to keep the six foot distance and to remain masked um, and to consider very carefully uh, the whole idea of people who are not from the same immunological bubble not being closer than six feet to other folks. And that can easily be um, forgotten when people are trying to sit at a table together. Uh, but other than that, uh, it's uh, reasonable to move ahead. Uh, <clears throat> this whole idea that there are a lot of things that are now available does not mean that uh, people really have to do all of that, right? Uh, it's important that parishes uh, clergy, uh, vestry, uh, everyone in the parish feel comfortable with what's going on uh, and not feel like they have to move ahead and do everything uh, that's, uh, that's available. One of the issues is that um, as uh, parishes are sending in plans, uh, a critical problem has been not providing enough information about measurements, uh, about how uh, groups are going to sit and or be properly distanced. So uh, we want to encourage people as they're sending in plans to do that. Uh, with regard to this whole issue of singing, um, there have been a lot of uh, discussions about that recently. And uh, there have been uh, a couple of pretty good research studies uh, looking at the degree to which uh, singing is or is not a problem. The difficulty right now is that we are weighing some of the new research against what we know to be the case, which is that um, singing in particular, along with family reunions and funerals and church services, unfortunately, are known to be super spreader uh, events. Uh, and so 
that we have uh, modified in the uh, distances um, so that we can take into consideration um, how it's safe to sing. Uh, so basically, if you're unmasked, you need to be 30 feet away from somebody else who's not of the same immunological bubble. Um, that can be reduced to 15 feet. If you have a face shield or you're using plexiglass barrier between the singer and uh, the next person or group of people that uh, might be in front of the singer. And that could be reduced to 10 feet if the singer's wearing a face mask. And there actually are some uh, pretty interesting face masks designed specifically for singers uh, that are supposed to be uh, acoustically very pleasing, although I haven't experienced them, so I can't really say that. But in terms of protection, uh, if you're wearing that mask, then being 10 feet away would be sufficient. So, all right, uh, that's it. I think I can stop sharing. And um, okay, happy to take any questions. Phil, a, a question came up in chat, which uh, actually um, goes along with something I wanted to ask you on behalf of uh, some folks who, who participated in my online worship meeting earlier this week. And we, and we talked about it in the, uh, the, the clergy town hall. It's, it's a little bit of clarification on what we mean by air exchange. Uh, through an HVAC system. I know some churches are who, who do have commercial air condition um, are still either leaving their door open or leaving their window open because they think they need more. Can you can you comment on that? Sure, sure. Uh, an HVAC system uh, in the U.S. Uh, and, and, and in most parts of the world are, are designed to generate at least three to four air changes an hour. Uh, that's with doors and windows closed. Now, um, opening doors and windows uh, actually helps both in terms of the amount of um, outside air that's entrained into the room um, and uh, in terms of the number of air exchanges that you can get. So opening doors and windows uh, in terms of ventilation and number of air changes and reducing the amount of uh, exposure to uh, virus-laden uh, respiratory droplets, uh, that's a very good thing to do, but not necessary. Again, if you have an HVAC system, uh, it is designed to be able to give you that minimum of three or four air changes an hour. Um, now, I, again, um, one of the tips is to try to work with the HVAC uh, company or engineer or maintenance person to try to entrain as much fresh air as reasonably possible, because that also reduces the risk. Okay. Uh, so some other questions in chat that I'll read, but, I, but before I do that, let me remind folks, uh, if, if you're on the phone uh, and you want to ask a question, you can dial star nine on your keypad to raise your hand. Um, if, you're, um, if you're joining any other way, uh, the participants window has a raise hand button or put it in the, uh, in the chat and we'll, we'll call on you. Uh, but uh, Phil, there's a question from Ted Massey who asks, is a MERV-13 filter rating equivalent to a HEPA filter? Uh, not necessarily. Um, HEPA filters uh, come in uh, various different um, um, effectiveness levels. So uh, they, it, it can be. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that you really have to talk with a uh, uh, HVAC engineer or technician uh, to look, uh, to understand uh, the degree to which it would be um, equivalent in, in your system, but, but they can be. Okay. But I, and on the question of filters, more is better, but not necessarily uh, required, like a, it's not required to have a, a HEPA filter, is that correct? Oh, it's not required to have a HEPA filter at all. Um, it, it, it is expected in that if you have um, either an HVAC system with three to four air changes or more an hour, or if you have a radiant energy system, say um, uh, radiators, right? Uh, and you have sufficient air movement so that you can physically detect a breeze uh, in the room, uh, that that should be sufficient. <clears throat> Adding a HEPA filter uh, or um, ultraviolet light uh, emitters to systems uh, will improve the, uh, or I should say, reduce the likelihood that there are entrained virus particles in the air. However, um, 
it is expected with just the minimum, the three to four air changes an hour, uh, whether that's generated by HVAC system or with, uh, with fans, uh, should be sufficient. Um, so it's not necessary, but uh, it's reasonable to do if, if you'd like. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then from Kathleen Waugh, she asks, uh, regarding singers, am I to understand that only one vocalist or three from the same household, or could there be more singers or choir with mask being able to sing? Hmm. Okay. Uh, if you have people from the same household, they can sing together uh, without mask, right? Uh, now, if you now have, uh, say, uh, two vocalists from one household, and now you have a third vocalist, that third vocalist, who's not from the same immunological bubble, would have to be, at a minimum, masked and 10 feet away, right? And if they're unmasked, they have to be 30 feet away from the other two singers. Um, so I hope that answers the question, but if not, uh, hit me again. Let's see, uh, I think I'm seeing here, could there be more singers? Um, well, okay, it's conceivable, right? That you could have more singers mask and spread 10 feet apart, right? And so depending upon the size of your building, that's, that's possible, sure. Uh, other questions from, from anyone? Um, if you'd like, you can just uh, unmute yourself. Hi, sorry. So yeah, I think the slide said it was three people max, even if they were from the same immunological bubble. Sorry, yes, 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 Mike. Yeah, I, I, I see you. And yes, um, that's because um, the research and the engineering to predict um, the plumes that are generated from a group larger than three um, are not well worked out. Got it. Now, uh, we, we, we are um, continuing to look and work with uh, you know, physicists and engineers and trying to figure out uh, exactly what all this means. And, and uh, so, uh, but right now, um, yeah, uh, three is the max because uh, e even if you're from the same household uh, and you group people together, the size of the plume that they produce. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, going yeah, toward. Yeah, and if they're right. So the Von Trapp family singers are out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. A mother, but a mother, father, and a child from the same house are a go, but pushy. That's the outer limit. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and, and keep in mind, the better the singer is, the more that they announce it and actually get yeah, their right. plumes, right? <laughs> so, <That's> right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know, Phil. I've, I've heard some not very good singers who could belt it out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. Other other questions? Or are we uh, ready to move on? Let's go ahead and move on, and we'll you know when we get to the open forum. If there are more questions for Phil, great, we'll do that. Um, but I want to give others uh, like Mary, 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 to story. I'm ready. How are you, Bishop? I'm well, how are you? I'm fine. Uh, the Learning and Breakthrough uh, Task Force presented our uh, presentation last week, which covered the five areas of ministry, and it basically spelled out phase one, uh, the collection and reflection part of the questionnaire. Uh, clergy has asked for a longer return time in order to include more people in the congregation to take part in the questionnaire. And we're still working on turning this on, uh, this is this uh, questionnaire to an online form and getting the cover materials together to go out with the questionnaire. So that's where we are. Great. Thank you, ma'am. Good. Welcome. All righty. Uh, Phyllis Jones, uh, everyone, I think most of you knew Phyllis just underwent uh, hip replacement surgery actually a week ago today. And so we're so glad she's here. Things have gone well. Phyllis, give us an update and then, um, and then give us the information you want to give us tonight, please. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yes, it's, um, as I mentioned, especially this morning with the clergy town hall, um, when a week ago at that particular time, I literally was in the operating room and it was just kind of miraculous to me to think that it was that, you know, that week ago and, and the amazing things that, uh, 
that surgeons do with things like this these days. Um, they had me up and around the same day. They had me home the next day. And then um, the rehab for this is just pretty much to, um, you know, to walk as much as I can tolerate. And uh, so between um, the walker that I have that I use for outside just to get a little bit of extra stability and the cane that I use when I'm wandering around the house here, um, I've been trying to, you know, balance that out and you know, figure out what the appropriate balance for that is. And anybody who knows me knows me well enough to know what a challenge that is for me. So uh, <laughs> trying to uh, make sure that I don't do too much. Yesterday was my, um, my first day completely off the pain meds and I did do a little bit too much yesterday. Um, so I kind of scaled it back a little bit today. So I'm learning, I am, I am trainable, you know. <laughs> just, sometimes it takes a little time getting it through my thick skull. Uh, but anyway, yeah, uh, I also just wanted to, again, take this opportunity to thank all of you for your thoughts, your prayers, uh, not only for my surgery, but also um, as I've been uh, grieving the loss of my dad. Um, so many, you know, uh, wonderful messages that really supported me uh, more than I know how to tell you um, through this, this, you know, this time. I, I'm not exactly sure what happened to August. You know, August of 2020 is for me always going to be sort of a uh, a weird time, um, but um, you know your thoughts and your prayers and your support have really helped me uh, through that. Uh, so I'm very grateful and just wanted to take the the opportunity to say thank you. Um, and then so on uh, to the business end of things. Um, I'm going to uh, go ahead and share my screen briefly if I can here. Let's see. Here we go. Um, to talk first and foremost, we had a, some conversation um, a while back with our friends from Church Insurance who actually were on um, some of our, our calls uh, back in July, uh, maybe even into early August, um, regarding you know, uh, to what degree uh, Church Insurance would be supporting us uh, with any potential claims we might experience uh, related to COVID-19. And um, so the statement that's up here uh, on the screen in front of you now um, came from an email that was sent by Mary Kate Wold, who is the uh, CEO of Church Pension Group, uh, in an email that came out to a bunch of us uh, last week. Um, so it was a little bit of an update from what we had previously heard from the folks who were on the calls with us, um, specifically the second paragraph. Um, the first paragraph, I think, is still, you know, pretty much where it was before uh, because the pandemic is just so uh, unusual and unique in nature. Um, it's hard to know uh, from an insurance standpoint if COVID-19 is going to constitute an occurrence um, that would trigger negligence coverage. However, what they have said, which to me was clearer um, than the guidance that we had last time, is that church insurance will provide a defense and cover the defense costs of such claims unless circumstances come to light that make it clear that the claim is not covered. And to me, this just kind of goes straight back to what we've been saying all along and what has been so very well covered uh, by our own Triple R task force um, is the importance of you know, having good solid plans, plans that have measurable distances included on diagrams and all of the detail that goes into uh, the development of a solid plan uh, along with the documentation that shows that you're following your plan. Uh, because the first thing that would make it clear that a claim would not be covered is if you had one and you didn't follow it. That would be, you know, that would, that would not bode well. That's basically openings for negligence. Um, and so it's just really super important. I can't underscore enough how important it is, um, you know, uh, to just to make sure for our own protection of each other, um, as well for the, as for these purposes, um, that we're being good stewards of our people and um, of all our protections um, by, by developing those plans and following them. So um, that final sentence also has not changed from the guidance that we were given before, which is that very strong um, uh, encouragement um, to contact church insurance immediately if an institution is faced with a coronavirus-related 
uh, negligence, claim, negligence claim. And as is in the emails that Bishop Stokes has been sending out, um, whenever a plan is approved uh, for whatever type of activity um, that's going on, um, that if any, if there are any claims uh, that come to any of you um, related to COVID-19, the first thing you should do is contact me. Um, and I will make sure that, you know, especially uh, you know, if, you, if, if you are covered by church insurance, um, that, um, you know, that they uh, I will help you make sure that they're notified immediately and I'll help follow, follow up with them as well. Now, I just want to clarify, it's not just claims though, that if there's any incidents of COVID-19 that comes through the church in any way, I want you notified. Right. Thanks. Yep. So, yep, that's all part of that process. Um, and um, I am aware that uh, there is a very small minority of congregations um, in our diocese who are not covered by church insurance. I was made aware of a few uh, instances, just one or two, where some of those companies are now actually issuing um, exclusions for communicable diseases. Um, so that tells you how the non-church insurance world is choosing to handle COVID-19. Um, and, you know, in those cases, uh, I think, you know, the only thing I can do, which is the same as I've done for the over 10 years I've been around, is just really encourage folks at least have church insurance come in and quote you on equivalent coverage to what you have now. Um, and, you know, really look hard um, at, at changing that coverage. Um, and uh, that's really the only way that, uh, you know, that you're going to make any change in your ability to be able to uh, respond should anything happen. So I just wanted to, um, to, to talk about that. And then, Steve, is there anything I should be answering in chat before I move on to my next topic? Well, uh, most of the chat, Phyllis, right now is uh, a lot of well wishes for you. I will, uh, I will encourage you to read those rather, <laughs> rather than me read them out. But I see that Wendy Blackman has her hand up. And Wendy, do you have a question for Phyllis? Yes. Phyllis, I have a quick question for you. Is there still money available to help churches open? Uh, yes, there is. Um, so um, we do have, um, uh, you know, money that we can uh, use to assist you. For example, if you need help with some of your disinfecting supplies or, you know, you have other things going on, um, you know, related to, um, you know, financial difficulties that you're finding because of COVID-19. Um, so, yes, please. There's not a, a formal a formal form for that. All I'm really asking is that you just, you know, by email or, you know, with an attachment, if you want to put a Word document or whatever, just, you know, make me aware of what your situation is and I will make sure that that um, uh, request gets in front of um, the, it, it'll, you know, uh, most likely be a diocesan council who will be the ones who will be helping, uh, you know, evaluate those requests through the Mission Renewal Fund. And this is probably a good place also just to restate what you've said before, Phyllis, to everybody. And that is that as we move into the fall and you start looking at your financials, if you see a material change in your condition, um, please, uh, and, and especially as it relates to marks of mission giving, uh, let Phyllis know. We want to work with everybody. Uh, it's just important that we know um, because obviously we need to plan just as you need to plan for your congregations about what variables are in front of us. One of the things that you'll see coming out um, in the next couple of weeks, just as we do this time every fall, um, is the Mark Submission Giving uh, letter that goes out, um, which will have the calculation um, for the Mark Submission Giving for 2021 on it. And I've already fielded, um, as Bishop Stokes mentioned, a couple of you know, uh, questions on this. So it's good, I think, thanks for the reminder that we can just talk about it now that um, you know, we have our, the um, requests that we make, the formula that we use is canonical. Okay, so I can't just across the board make or nor, neither can finance and budget or any of our governing bodies make a change um, in the way that the asking is calculated um, because that is canonical. And what will be happening this year in anticipation that it's kind of a unique year all around, that convention will approve the revised formula 
uh, for the marks of mission giving is that the request that you receive will be calculated under the new formula, uh, which means it will either be um, at worst equal to or at best less than many congregations will be see a reduction in the amount of the ask based on the new formula. Um, but that is something that we have to calculate using that formula. Um, and then uh, that's part of the, that's the reason that we have the board of consultation uh, because having moved to a mandatory system, that is the, um, the place that we would go for an adjustment. So that, that part of the process hasn't changed. If anything, it's probably become even more important. Um, and those are the places where, you know, we have the opportunity to hear from you. Um, and that, that first opportunity to hear from you can even be in your response to the mark submission giving uh, re requests that we're making. So if for whatever reason you're not able to commit to the full 100% ask, uh, the information that you provide to us uh, in response will be directly forwarded on to the Board of Consultation and then they'll set up time to, you know, to talk with you about that. Um, but I think, again, we developed that particular response because we know this is not a cookie cutter approach. We want to know the things that are happening that are impacting you. Um, and that was something we wanted to know even before COVID-19 was ever on anybody's horizon. It just has become even more important now. So, um, so thanks. Um, and I did see um, there was a question that popped up in the chat about projections for clergy compensation. Um, that typically doesn't happen until about mi maybe mid-October to early November that the Standing Commission on Clerical Compensation puts those things out. However, you know, I have over the past, you know, again, decade plus that I've been here, I've, ne I've rarely if ever seen it exceed a 1% change per year. So I wouldn't think that this year is going to be any different. Um, you know, so I think that gives us a pretty narrow range, uh, you know, to be able to at least forecast budget wise. And we, and we heard from um, Pat Hawkins, our benefits officer, that, you know, the, uh, the health insurance information has come in for the upcoming year. And uh, I asked her uh, what the increase was. And she said roughly 4%, which is under the national uh, average. So that gives you, again, another piece of information for calculation's sake. Right. And I believe that the Benefits Committee either met today or is meeting tomorrow morning um, to formally approve the menu plan of choices. So as soon as that happens, uh, I know Pat will be getting out the specific numbers. So you'll be able to, you know, to use those to, to know. And just, just to add on to that, Phyllis, I know uh, Pat is going to be scheduling a benefits workshop sometime in the next couple of weeks. And the announcement for that will be in tomorrow's Good news in the garden state with the ability to sign up for it great thanks okay. and i think I see, uh, yeah. wendy's hand is up again yeah yeah um phyllis the reason i asked you that question is somebody from st mark's from the uh, finance said they had sent a request to you about um to find out if there were monies available for opening i didn't hear from you uh, yeah, well, as I mentioned before, I, you know, apologize if that slipped through my many cracks during the month of August, that would be perfectly uh, understandable. Uh, would it have been Ina? Because I know I had just responded mm -hmm. to a couple emails of hers today. No, I thought it was from Fred Ellis. Oh, okay. Well, I'll double check and see. And oh, um, should we, should we resubmit it again? Yeah, that couldn't hurt. Okay. Yep. That would be All fine. right. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to make sure that we covered uh, today um, is uh, actually two more things. The next one is um, you may have, uh, re you may remember um, that on August the 8th, uh, there were some executive orders that uh, were issued by the president um, in uh, the absence of any further stimulus action from Congress. Uh, ideas of, you know, what, what some of the things that he wanted to do unilaterally one of which was to um, declare a payroll tax, what he called a holiday um, for social security withholding from our employees' paychecks. Um, so this is something that would only apply to our lay employees since our clergy do not have social security withheld uh, from their paychecks. Um, and there was uh, basically no guidance that was given uh, as to how this was to be implemented 
um, just a September 1st implementation date. And even as we got into the last part of August, there was still very, there was, there was basically no guidance that was out there until at the very 11th hour, we started getting, uh, I guess the, the, the um, de Treasury Department um, did put out some guidelines uh, as far as um, uh, clarification. The main important clarification that we got was that this is not a mandatory program. It is optional. Um, and the other, so that's uh, point number one. Point number two, this is not a um, forgiveness of the Social Security withholding. This is a deferral. And that's very important uh, for you as employers, as well as whoever, whichever employees may decide to uh, participate, uh, to understand this is something they have to pay back unless something changes uh, between now and the end of the year. So the way the program is set up to run is that your lay employees have the option to be able to request uh, that you not withhold for Social Security, that's the 6.2%, um, between now and the end of 2020, so December 31st, 2020. Um, and then as we move into 2021, so that's a, basically a four month time span, um, beginning January 1st of 2021 through April 30th of 2021, um, that money is, needs to be repaid. So basically what would happen is they would have to double up on their withholding um, in the early part of 2021 until the amount that they had deferred was actually repaid. Um, and, you know, just to kind of give you a, a relative idea uh, numbers wise, if you have a, an employee that's making $1,000 a week, that means that they would see another $62 per week in their paychecks between now and the end of the year. Um, and so that would come up just under $1,000 extra that they would see cumulatively in their paychecks between now and December 31st, which they would then have to repay in the first four months of 2021 by having extra withholdings taken. That's the way that things stand right now. Um, and uh, you know, one of the other things that, again, we as employers need to be aware of um, is that uh, we are ultimately responsible as employers for the repayment of that money. So if something happens, you have an employee that gets laid off, you know, something like that, where you can no longer collect um, during the first four months of the year, uh, you are still liable as an employer for the repayment of that money. So for the extra, you know, uh, fairly minimal amount, um, you know, uh, that is being realized uh, by most of our lay employees, um, a lot of what I've been hearing back so far is that they're choosing not to participate in the program. It's just too much trouble. It's more trouble than it's worth. Um, and uh, they don't want to have to be on the hook for repaying it um, in next year. Who knows what's going to happen next year? <laughs> so, uh, but it is an option for them. So what I um, am uh, doing is I'm just developing for diocesan staff and I'll share this, you know, with um my uh, list of folks who participate on our financial resourcing uh, calls and our uh, stewardship calls uh, is sort of a, a draft letter, a draft communication to our own diocesan staff who would qualify for this. Um, just basically making them aware that the option is out there. It is their choice. If they say that they want to have this, then I'm obligated uh, to make it available to them. And if they want it, I'll do that. Um, but then they can, you know, they have to let me know for sure if they want it or not. And it's my opportunity to make sure that they're very well aware that they have to repay it unless something changes. So um, are there any questions on that? Not seeing anything, Phyllis. Okie doke. Then um, last but not least, and I cannot believe I forgot to say this this morning at the clergy town hall. So I am going to count on all of you guys to make sure that your clergy uh, are aware of this and make sure that it gets broadcast uh, you know, throughout the congregations. Um, we have three uh, pre-convention hearings coming up. <laughs> and I know that sounds like really weird, pre-convention hearings, oh my gosh. Um, but we, uh, we do have a uh, diocesan budget that has been recast. We're going to be posting that on the website soon. Um, and, uh, you know, there'll be, uh, uh, probably some new, uh, nominations for offices, things that, you know, we would, as well as reminders on the, uh, canonical, uh, changes and the, uh, 
uh, resolutions that are up for voting uh, at this year's convention since it is a virtual convention um, and it's going to be you know all of the voting is going to be entirely virtual we're going to be doing a lot of you know uh, things for the first time this year we are going to be doing bare bones business at our convention and we need to make sure to the best extent we possibly can um, that are that we're as prepared as possible going in um, so our pre-convention hearings are going to be on Monday, October the 26th. Um, we're going to have one at one o'clock in the afternoon. These are virtual, okay? Um, and so this isn't by, obviously by convocation anymore. It doesn't need to be. This is another thing that I think is actually going to be a, a you know, a benefit for us uh, as we move forward, um, that we don't have to do things by convocation. It's going to be virtual. Um, so on Monday, October the 26th, there's going to be one of them at one in the afternoon and one of them at seven in the evening. And then on Thursday, October the 29th, we're going to have another one in the evening, 7 p.m. in the evening. So those three uh, times for the pre-convention hearings um, I'd like you to just make note of, mark down on your calendars, and please do uh, make sure that your clergy uh, are aware and that that uh, information gets really well circulated, um, you know, uh, especially through to your, um, uh, to your, your uh, deputies, your delegates to the, to the convention. Um, and that's all I got. Great. Thank you, Phyllis. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's just open it up. Does anyone have any questions, insights, concerns you want to share? Alice, can you repeat the first two dates for the pre-convention, please? Yeah, the first date is Monday, October the 26th. Uh -huh. One meeting at one in the afternoon and another one at seven in the evening. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And on one other scheduling note, I almost forgot to mention this too, now that we're moving back into the fall, um, we have uh, made, uh, made our schedule uh, for our financial resourcing meetings and our stewardship uh, and sustainability uh, meetings uh, alternating now bi-weekly. So um, just to kind of catch everybody up on where we are in that sequence right now next week, uh, will be the stewardship uh, stability and sustainability meetings. Um, they will, that's the one, one happens on Tuesday evening at seven. The other happens at, on Wednesday morning at 10. Um, and uh, then the following week, Monday the 21st, will be the next round of financial resourcing meetings where we go through some of the things like the cash flow projections and uh, you know, uh, how they tie into uh, some of the things that are happening with the stewardship stability and sustainability. Um, you know, again, we've uh, had some really wonderful sharing in those meetings. I personally have, you know, again, found them to be a wonderful way to get to know a lot of the financial folks um, who are working uh, in our congregations a lot better. Um, and we, uh, you know, so I really would encourage everybody to continue um, with their participation in those meetings, especially as we go into stewardship uh, season in the fall. Um, uh, and I guess if I can take just, you know, maybe a couple more minutes, I just, um, for the stewardship, we this year uh, are going to do something a little bit different um, than we've done in the past is that we are going to have a designated diocesan stewardship Sunday. Um, that's going to be on October the 18th. Um, and for that particular Sunday, uh, Bishop Stokes is going to uh, record a stewardship sermon based on the um, the gospel reading uh, for, for that particular week. Um, I believe it's the render under, under Caesar. Yep. Yes, it is. <laughs> so, uh, so we'll have that going on. And again, it's a way for us to really recognize all across our diocese uh, that, um, you know, we're, we're really celebrating stewardship uh, together uh, as an entire group. That doesn't mean you have to do your in-gathering on that Sunday. Um, I, I'm well aware uh, that a lot of our congregations have their own schedules for their, their stewardship seasons and how they conduct them. So my encouragement to you is just to see how this fits into your particular schedule. Maybe it's the Sunday where you launch your stewardship season. Maybe it's in the middle of your stewardship season. Maybe it is your in-gathering Sunday. Um, but just an opportunity for all of us to be participating together, knowing that everybody across our diocese is doing the same thing. 
Good. Other questions, concerns? I, I want to remind people I do have a Bible study on Wednesday night. It's been really a lot of fun for me to do, um, and you're always welcome to jump in on it. It's well, I'm always going to look at the gospel reading for the week upcoming. And so um, that's Wednesday evenings at seven o'clock. Love to have you be part of that. Anything else for the good of the order? All righty. And the Bible study is with Ryan Jemmett. So he and I are taking turns uh, offering that. And that, so I think it's nice to have that uh, dual perspective. I'm grateful to Brian for his willingness to do that with me. It's just great. It's fun. And I did just put the registration link into chat. For Great. Thank you for that. All righty. Well, let's, without further ado, let's go to Compline. The Lord Almighty grant us a peaceful night and a perfect end. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. The maker of heaven and earth. Let us confess our sins to God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought and word and deed, and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us all our offenses, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. May the Almighty God grant us forgiveness of all our sins and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. Psalm 31. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Incline your ear to me, make haste to deliver me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe for you are my crag and my stronghold. For the sake of your name, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that they have secretly set for me, for you are my tower of strength. Into your hands I commend my spirit, for you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thanks be to God. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. Thus, O Lord, is the apple of your eye. Hide us under the shadow of your wings. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, hear our prayer. And let our cry come to you. Let us pray. Be present, O merciful God, and protect us through the hours of this night, so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of this life may rest in your eternal changelessness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen a litany during the coronavirus pandemic. Jesus Christ, you traveled through towns and villages curing every disease and illness. At your command, the sick were made well. Come to our aid now in the midst of the global spread of the coronavirus that we may experience your healing love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heal those who are sick with the virus. May they regain their strength and health through quality medical care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heal us from our fear, which prevents nations from working together and neighbors from helping one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heal us from our pride, which can make us claim invulnerability to a disease that knows no borders. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Jesus Christ, healer of all, stay by our side in this time of uncertainty and sorrow. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with those who have died from the virus. May they be at rest with you in your eternal peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with the families of those who are sick or have died. As they worry and grieve, defend them from illness and despair. May they know your peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with the doctors, nurses, researchers, and all medical professionals who seek to heal and help those affected, as well as those who perform essential services to sustain our common life and who put themselves at risk in the process. Be with those who through injustice have been wantonly exposed to the disease. May they all know your protection and peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with the leaders of all nations. Give them the foresight to act with charity and true concern for the well-being of the people they are meant to serve. Give them the wisdom to invest in long-term solutions that will help prepare for or prevent future outbreaks. May they know your peace as they work together to achieve it on earth. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Whether we are at home or abroad, surrounded by many people suffering from this illness, or only a few, Jesus Christ, stay with us as we endure and mourn, persist and prepare. In place of our anxiety, give us your peace. Jesus Christ, heal us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. A prayer for the oppressed. Look with pity, O Heavenly Father, upon the people in this land who live with injustice, racism, terror, disease, and death as their constant companions. Have mercy upon us. Help us to eliminate our cruelty to these, our neighbors. Strengthen those who spend their lives establishing equal protection of the law and equal opportunities for all. And grant that every one of us may enjoy a fair portion of the riches of this land through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to bring to the forefront of your consciousness those people and those things for which you're praying. I'm incredibly mindful that tomorrow is September 11th, a day of great pain and suffering for so many, as we remember those who died in the Twin Towers and in Pennsylvania, in Washington, as we remember those who responded, the brave first responders and others uh, who reached out. Um, so we lift all of those uh, and those who grieve uh, in our prayers. Uh, we, we pray for coronavirus, but mindful of the 190,000 now who have died in this country of coronavirus. Uh, we pray for um, Phyllis's continued healing, for Brian Jemmett's continued healing from foot surgery, for Kathy DeJohn, who was hospitalized uh, recently. We pray for um, Oscar Maurer, husband of Deacon Sally Maurer, for uh, Susan Osborne Mott and her husband, Brad. And we pray for those to be ordained uh, this coming week, Jorge Martinez and Thomas uh, Zerba, and also uh, from our diocese to be ordained in other dioceses because they've been called to other dioceses, Doug Worthington and Catherine Zorick. for Andrew Calandrello, who's going to be received into the priesthood later this month. We pray also for the victims of the wildfires in the West and also for the first responders working so hard uh, to try to contain just an impossible situation. We just ask for your protection uh, and your safety for so many who are in harm's way. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ, give rest to the weary, bless the dying, soothe the suffering, pity the afflicted, shield the joyous, and all for your love's sake. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Lord, you now have set your servant free to go in peace as you have promised. For these eyes of mine have seen the Savior, whom you have prepared for all the world to see, a light to enlighten the nations and the glory of your people Israel. 
Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. Thank you all very much for being part of this tonight, and we'll see you next time. God bless you and keep you.